So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Ana Nieto. I'm the head of the Species Conservation Action Team here at IUCN. Um, today, we will be focusing on wildlife conservation in challenging environments. And with this webinar, we wanted to portray the sometimes challenging circumstances under which species conservation takes place. So we're going to dive into real world challenges and hopefully inspire healthy discussions and debate on how to conserve uh, species more effectively. So in IUCN's portfolio of projects, either from the Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program or from the Save Our Species Program, our partners work in pretty tough conditions, be it harsh climates, remote areas, or, or politically unstable countries or regions. But despite these difficulties, their commitment to conservation remains strong, highlighting the urgency of their mission. So the webinar will provide a practical look into the realities of conservation efforts, bridging that gap between our understanding and the experiences of those on the ground. It's a chance to gain insights into the challenges and successes of individuals working hard to protect threatened species. So looking at the agenda today, uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. David Malon, who will set the scene and also provide a brief introduction to the topic. Uh, David is a special advisor of the IUCN Species Survival Commission. He has had experiences in various challenging landscapes around the world, in places like the Caucasus, the Himalayas, Central Asia, Africa, also um, the Arabian Peninsula. We will also hear from uh, three speakers from three different conservation projects, each offering practical lessons and solutions developed in demanding environments. We will have then a panel discussions with a Q&A session. So please make sure that you write your questions on the chat so David can pick up uh, those questions and, and ask the, the speakers to reflect on those on those questions and provide an answer. And I think with that, I just hope that you uh, have a, um, an enriching experience, that you uh, renew your commitment to preserving our planet's vulnerable biodiversity, and that you enjoy the, the webinar. Thank you all, and let's get started. Over to you, David. OK, thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Um, as Anna said, I'm David Mallon. Uh, I'm based in Manchester in the UK. I've been a member of the Species Survival Commission for about 30 years, and I'm now a, uh, a special advisor. So it's a real pleasure to be here again, to be here today in, in this, uh, in the, taking part in this webinar. And I'm going to start off by just uh, a, giving a quick overview as to what we mean by challenging environments. So, what a, challenging environments covers a whole pile of different uh, factors. So we might have challenging climate, difficult terrain, remote field sites. We might have political instability and insecurity. Things that we often don't always think about are the regulations and bureaucracy, which can sometimes be extremely challenging when organizing a project. There may be no infrastructure in place at the field site and in some places, there's no government presence. There are no government agencies or protected areas or staff. Quite often, several of these factors operate at the same site, compounding each other and making uh, life even more complicated for people organizing the field project. The main consequences of these challenging factors are, first of all, they may present risks to the health and safety of the field teams and to our local partners which is the most important consideration. Secondly, they tend to reduce the effective field time. Harsh climates, remote and inaccessible field sites means we have a lot longer time reaching our site before we can start work. And at the same time, these difficulties also increase the complexity of project planning and increase the costs. So given all these things, why do we actually want to work in these situations? Well, I think the answer is quite simple. We're all committed to conserving all species and all their habitats throughout the world, so we don't have any choice. 
the wildlife themselves, the species themselves, don't recognize these challenging environments. That's where they normally live. So we don't have any, so we have no choice. We have to get on with it. So first of all, I think if we said challenging environments, people would first of all think about severe climates. So extreme temperatures, very hot, very cold, high humidity, high rainfall, and even high altitude. All of these uh, things, as I said in, in the first in the introduction there, impose considerations on the health and safety of the field terms, of the field teams. It means we have less working time every day. And again, the project time and costs both increase. Secondly, we have difficult terrain, rugged mountains, desert sand dunes, very difficult to drive through, for example, tundra and polar regions, dense forests, and then large rivers. So these mean that field sites are very difficult to access or inaccessible. The problems with navigation, crossing rivers, we may have to cut our own tracks. And again, consequences for logistics, project time and health and safety. So quick example there from a IUCN partner project in Liberia on the pygmy hippo uh, conservation. The right hand photo shows one of the local rangers cutting a, a transect through the forest to place a camera trap, camera, camera trap grid. And to put in the 54 cameras took us about four or five days to, to complete that task. Sometimes the field sites are just very remote, a long way from any kind of transport net network or poor roads or no roads at all. Again, increasing the costs and the reduced amount of field time, difficult logistics, and also issues of emergency and rescue in case of some health emergency or accident. So the example below from a, uh, a Darwin project on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, um, from Beijing, it took three hours of flight, then a two day drive, and then a horseback ride to reach the field site. And this was to support some local communities in establishing uh, nature reserves. The field site was also at 4,500 uh, meters in elevation, so that a lot of acclimatization was needed as, as well as the issues of accessibility. Political volatility covers quite a lot of things. Insecurity and conflict, we only need to look at the news to see examples of this all over the world every day. Criminal activity and banditry, as an, uh, uh, other issues. And then again, the safety of the field teams is brought into, uh, into question. Something we don't always consider though, is that if we need uh, armed guards, police or military to accompany us to field sites, does this create a hostile environment or a challenging environment on behalf of the local people? See the example below. This is a, an IUCN Sir Peter Scott fund Arabian Leopard project in Western Yemen, where the government insisted that we took a military escort of eight soldiers and, and trucks and everything else to make sure that uh, everybody on the project was, was kept safe. Regulations and bureaucracy. Anybody who's worked on a project knows how exasperating and how annoying these uh, can, these these uh, regulations can be. We have visas. We may need travel permits to reach uh, restricted zones or border zones. Most countries have research permits, quite rightly, to ensure that the results of the research are shared locally with either the government or with local experts. There may be restrictions on the import of equipment, customs fees to pay on equipment like camera trapping, camera, camera traps and such like, and some places impose restrictions on technology. So in large parts of the world, it's impossible to conduct aerial surveys at low level. Satellite and radio collars are also often subject to restrictions of one kind or another, drones also forbidden, and even in some places, the import of GPS is not allowed. Then finally, another aspect that we often forget are the challenging human landscapes, which this takes many forms. People are more and more displaced by climate change or famine or insecurity, forcing them to migrate to other areas. This increases pressure on the environment, 
especially where communities are completely dependent on bushmeat or other natural resources. Some communities are suspicious of outsiders or, and or the government agencies and may not understand the rationale for, for a, a biodiversity uh, conservation project in, in their home area. And there's generally a lack of awareness of biodiversity conservation. The species or a habitat which is uh, perfectly familiar to local people may be regarded by the conservation community as particularly rare or valuable. And this needs explaining in great detail to, to the local people who've just taken it as part of their uh, everyday existence. Well, that's my brief um, introduction to the to the to the issue. Um, we're now going to move on to some more in-depth uh, presentations. And I'm delighted to say that we've got three experienced and also young conservationists who are going to talk about their projects from, as Anna said, three different co uh, continents. Dr. Neil Wynn from Myanmar, Dr. Stella Egbe from Nigeria and Christian Sarcedo from, Ch from Chile. We're going to start with Dr. Nailwin, who works with FFI in Myanmar, and he's going to talk about the, a tiger conservation project in that country. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your introduction. Uh, I thank you, everyone, all the participants. Yeah, greetings from Myanmar, and very nice to meet you all. So today, let me share about our HPN on the uh, community-based tiger conservation in the in southern Myanmar Chinese landscape. So firstly, let me introduce with a very brief of the Myanmar. So Myanmar is located in the South Asia and, and then uh, share the border with Thailand in the east. So the Chinese is uh, also the our project site is located in the southern portion of the Myanmar. So you can see in the, you know, the, the, in the inside map, in the red drop is the, our project area. The enlarged one is basically, that is a lowland area also with the, you know, the Sunyas lowland, uh, large area of the Sunyas lowland forest. So we say, you know, uh, this is, this area is the one of the Myanmar less townhold for the globally threatened species like, uh, you know, tiger and Asian elephant, elephant and also the center pangolin and also the sand bear, like this kind of, the, you know, the threatened species. And um, the, also this area is a very rich biodiversity. Again, there's also facing with the same kind of threat. It's like, main threat is like poaching and illegal trade, you know, uh, goes by the locusts and, you know, the people, you know, cross the border and do something like about the, you know, the hunting and, you know, also like the booster system and also for the commercial, you know, you know, hunting and also trading for that. And in addition to that, uh, the another issue, uh, the threatened, I mean, the case threatened to the, the species is the encroachment for the agriculture in this, this area. So this is photo is showing the, you know, the, 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 the largest area of the Soviet lowland forest in Chenidari in our project area. Next slide, please. So what is what is happening there? What is our challenges for the conservation in this area? So this area is actually very remote area uh, because of the very long civil war since uh, about 1916, 17, and, and then until about about the you know uh, early 2000 and, and then later that area has uh, some kind of road network and and then even though and developed and remove area so after the you know the the, the road network is uh, establishes there is already you know uh, happening about the uh, you know people moving and also like new plantation and also you know creating a lot of uh, threat in this area as you see in the photo you know the part of the uh, forest area is clear for their, their plantation. And also again, uh, it's like this area because of the rich biodiversity, uh, government uh, was uh, kind of about, about 20 years, uh, yeah, about uh, early 2010, they also make a, a kind of the, what do you call, the, the, the nominate the uh, new project area, but later, uh, due to the sand removal area and, and then conflict with the local uh, group and also like a local uh, insurgent group, uh, this nomination was, you know, removed and now back to the, you know, the normal uh, forest and non-priority area at the moment. And um, also that, ago, 
again, you know, community in this area is uh, totally rely on their natural resources. And also they are doing agriculture for their livelihood and all of the state expand their, you know, their agriculture into the, the forest area. And the, also again, you know, because community also rely on the, uh, for, I mean, the, the meat for the bush meat and also there's also trade for the bush meat to the neighboring country. And, you know, that kind of thing is happy, happening. That's, that is the, you know, our uh, challenges before uh, 2021. But in 2000, early 2021, we also have a, a, another challenges additional to the previous one. Uh, that is about the, the political change. So military could happen in Myanmar. And so after that, you know, this area has a, a, a kind of, you know, the insecurity as the political situation in this area is not really stable. And there's an armed conflict happening. And so, you know, there's some kind of rope but blocked by the insurgent group or armed group. And so, and um, also some other villages are not, you know, uh, able to assess. And even, you know, some of the villages has to be, you know, just placed to the, the other area. So, you know, in terms of the, you know, our feeding, they also have some like uh, insecurity condition and also like local community also feeding, you know, a kind of, you know, political uh, instability and, you know, insecurity condition uh, they are facing there. Um, uh, but, but luckily, you know, uh, because of this area is like kind of, you know, part of the uh, key habitat for the, the tiger conservation in Myanmar. So we still have, uh, you know, uh, lucky enough to have a uh, support from the IUCN and KF Blue to continue the tiger conservation in, in this area. Uh, because within it, you know, even though the political is unstable, you know, tiger conservation should be continued. Otherwise, you know, we will also lose the, 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 the key, you know, habitat and also like the key population of the tiger will be, you know, something like, you know, creating more, 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 more security position. Uh, that's why, you know, we decided to continue our project with the support of IUC and the KF Blue funding. And, and also like, you know, this kind of uh, political situation, and also like, we are not sure, you know, who is really control this area. There is no uh, government authority uh, was not there, you know, and also like there's uh, at least three uh, groups or, you know, M, M groups are controlling this area. And so we decided, you know, there's only the community-based conservation, the working with the local community for protection of the, uh, the tiger is only, uh, you know, possible and, you know, only, only so by the approach for the you know the tiger conservation. So that's why so we set up our goal as that you know that it's like a, like a community based conservation. So to monitor wildlife and wildlife crime through community based networks and also you know supporting uh, local community to improve uh, their livelihood and also to reduce the dependency on the, the, the wildlife for 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 that. Yeah. So what do we do that. So basically, like, you know, everyone is normally do that, like, before we're using, like, okay, community-based conservation. Uh, yes, we also do community conservation, uh, but here the difference is the we have, uh, normally in the other area, we have a community-based conservation plus, you know, a kind of, you know, policy or a kind of, you know, enforcement. We are also have to deal with government. But in our side, we, are, have, we have only purely community-based conservation. We cannot make any, you know, enforcement working with the government because there is no, you know, government body there. So we have, we cannot deploy any of the policy or, you know, we cannot any regulation, you know, with the, with the government here yeah, because there's no, no authority in, in this area. So that's why our uh, approach is purely community-based conservation. And then you to, to monitor that, you know, the taiga and uh, to protect the taiga and the free species in the key tiger, key, key tiger habitat. Uh, we cannot make a very larger area, the whole area, but we have to choose the very specific site, you know, smaller area uh, where, you know, community can uh, properly monitor and protect the tiger. We have to select a very key site for that. So this this was also like combined with the, the remote sensing analysis. So we also like using the you know the land cover chain and that is just for remote sensing just for to see the the, the 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 broader landscape area where you know there's other areas keep changing or maybe they have a threat or something like this. So for the working with the community, 
So we uh, make sure, you know, about the community have a capacity about the uh, doing the, you know, this kind of, you know, the, the taiga and the pre monetary for the Malay, you know, for the setting at the camera trapping or uh, doing the forest patrol. And also, like, you know, uh, for their, you know, support, you know, to get involved in the, in the you know, the, the conservation activity and also like to reduce the, uh, you know, about the handy pressure of the, or the, you know, the tiger prey. So we also support the, the, the livelihood uh, development to the community there. So in here, I like to make a little bit about the exp uh, explanation about the, uh, you know, saturation. We really care about the, when we are working with the community, we really care about their, their safety. So we follow the, you know, the ESMS uh, procedure and process. And uh, the key thing we are doing is the, for the high risk in this area is the security concern. So we make sure uh, because of our project, our project activity, you know, community uh, cannot have uh, any issue with their, their, their security team. So, so we have to be, you know, uh, deal with the, Three M groups, you know, control in this area. We have to be, you know, make some kind of negotiating, and we also have to be, uh, you know, before they are, you know, camera trapped, we have to be uh, discussed with the team, you know, in advance, and you know, make sure everything has, uh, you know, understand about our team is going there, you know, to make sure there is no, you know, landmark is not setting up, you know, in the area where we camera trapped. That that's kind of thing we have to deal with that. So we ensure, you know, community has uh, no issue about their, you know, their, their security. And also, again, for our feeding, we also have to be made sure following the, our uh, safety uh, regulation and also make sure all the projects is properly before our feeding is, you know, uh, visiting to the villages and forests together with the uh, community. So, uh, so beside that, uh, beside that, we also have the, you know, uh, working with a kind of, you know, assessment in this area. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we also have the, something like about that together with, the, you know, this kind of supporting. We also have uh, awareness and also like, you know, the, the wildlife, you know, consumption and the trade or this area would also do that. And also another activity, we also working with the freelance uh, from the organization in, in Thailand. So it's just kind of, you know, transboundary. We like to see what is happening in the border area and we are working together with the, the freelance, you know, to monitor and take up great at the Thailand side. Thank you. The next slide, please. So so what is the, what kind of, you know, says that we, we got it, you know, even though during this thing. So we were able to support a community globally, you know, as I mentioned, you know, without any, Concern about the you know security problem, a safety problem, so the the, the community can make uh, you know the uh, regular patrol team in the in the key area, and yeah, they found it you know the last record of honey and snare uh, in the you know in the uh, during the uh, patrolling, and no records or occurrence or tiger handy in this area, and also with the camera trapping setting that the, the, the thing we got is, you know, we can also record it as five tiger, five individual tiger uh, in the, you know, the smaller uh, key key area, but including the two new individual. So we 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 have some kind of, you know, some numbers or recorded tiger individual in the whole landscape, uh, but we never recorded before these two new individual in there. So so that is one of our, you know. I mean, what I call significant achievement for the community based thing. And the another one is like the about the you know the replication. So what what currently you know we are doing is like a smaller area of the uh you know the you know the uh, activity in the landscape. You can see in the in the red top at the bottom of the mat, the smaller area. Currently we are able to do that. Uh, but we think we should, you know, expand the, our activity. We, we, you know, replicated uh, this kind of model uh, to the northern part of the area because of the, you can see in the other uh, green forest cloud, those are also the, the, the key area of the uh, tiger habitats. And, and then, you know, within it, you know, in the, in the future, that we can, be, you know, uh, expanding our activity to the, the other, uh, the green bulbs area. And also again together with the library school of the, the people who live in the you know uh, nearby the, this kind of habitat. So the last slide, this is the conclusion of our in, 
uh, our input of the project. You know, current situation is the, as I mentioned before, there's this like kind of, you know, absent of the government authority, um, but just only M groups are controlling, you know, in this area and, uh, you know, there's, you know, we are, you know, working with the, uh, in the difficult uh, situation and, you know, day by day, you know, the community has to be, you know, deal with the, those kind of M group and our project is also deal with the, deal with the, those people, you know, I mean, the M group, you know, to safety of the, our team. Uh, but, you know, uh, the state local community has, uh, you know, successfully protected the tiger and, you know, the record and the individual, as I mentioned before. And also, like, another thing we found out is the, the recently we were also there, you know, as a meeting with the community and then they are willing to, you know, uh, collaborate with the tiger, tiger, tiger conservation. And also, again, you know, they also like to be, uh, you know, deploy the alternative livelihood to reduce the, uh, you know, the, 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 the dispensing of the, you know, the uh, forest resources and also, you know, to reduce the ending of this kind of thing. So, uh, for my, you know, conclusion for this presentation, you know, uh, everybody is working a lot about the community-based conservation, but in our project, you know, we are now doing is like very purely community-based conservation. And, and then, you know, again, you know, the, the, our within is, you know, the, without the, you know, what it call community participation, you know, for the long term, uh, the project cannot be maintained, uh, maintained is successfully. So, you know, working with community, I think, you know, even though with the current situation not changing for another two, three years, but, you know, we can uh, protect the, you know, the remaining uh, tiger population in other key sites, uh, you know, that still protected by the community. Thing. And thank you very much. I think that is my best slide. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, by the way, there is our, you know, community patrol team, you know, working with the forest, you know, they are, they are doing patrolling and also like moving their camp to one place to another. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nedouin. That certainly was a, some challenging environments. Um, now we're going to move on to Dr. Stella Egbe from the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, who will talk about their project in the Lake, uh, Kainji Lake National Park. Thank you very much. Um, good day, everyone. And um, I'm glad to be sharing our experience from um, the emergency rescue of Nigerians' population of wildcats in Kainji Lake National Park of Nigeria. I bring you greetings from Nigeria, and I hope that you enjoy um, this conversation. Uh, my name is Tela Egbe, and I'll take you through this talk in the next um, couple of minutes. So um, the wild cat population in Nigeria, particularly lions and leopards, have declined significantly um, over the years. And currently in Nigeria, estimates are 50 individuals of um, lions. And then the populations of leopard have become extremely rare in the historical ranges. Our lion populations are now limited to two sites um, across, the con in, across the country. One is the Yankari Game Reserve. And then the second one is Kainji Lake National Park in the um, central part of Nigeria. Next slide, please. Next slide. And Kainji Lake, Kainji Lake National Park is one of the historical sites uh, for both uh, for the lions and the leopard. I think you have skipped one of the slides I'm supposed to talk about. But let me continue. So Kanji Lake National Park is one of the historical sites where we um, have leopards in the past. And, and then we also have a population of lions currently. Um, the park covers uh, an area of fa over 5,000 kilometers square and has two sectors, the Borugu and the Zuguruma sector. The lions are, um, the lion range is in one of the sectors of, of the park. Next slide. And what um, the threats to um, the wildcats in the country um, across sites has been habitat loss. This is one of the major um, threats that we have because um, Nigeria is a very Nigeria has a very large population and it is growing, and so there is increasing demand for land for 
farming, which is one of the major occupations that you have across the country. There's also habitat disturbance. So habitats that are natural ranges for this species are perturbed by people. And this is also disturbing um, species within their natural ranges. Poaching and hunting is also uh, major. Um, across Nigeria, there are wildlife markets where animal and animal parts are sold for different reasons. And this, uh, the demand for this um, animal parts is a direct threat to the population um, and it affects a wide range of species. Uh, you also have human wildlife conflicts in different areas, which is one of the pressures that we're trying to address with this project. One other uh, major threat to wildlife is illegal grazing. So in most parts of the savannah of Nigeria, you have um, livestock farming as a major occupation, but the kind of farming that is popular here in Nigeria is open grazing, where cattle is um, um, carried around and they feed in areas where they find food. Most times protected areas are easy easy areas for this 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 kind of um raising of cattle and it's a major threat to not just not just directly to the population of of wild cats but the prey that they feed upon because it creates competition in these spaces and then you also have a lot of uh, protected areas but the resources to manage them are quite limited and imagine challenges that we are beginning to contend with is the impact of climate change and in the next slide, I will tell you how climate change has exacerbated the threats that we are facing and the challenges that have emerged through the life span of this project. Now, considering the threats I've talked about, um, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, that is a major stakeholder in conservation in Nigeria, um, applied for the grants um, to make impact and um, contribute to the conservation of lions in Kanj and leopards in Kanji Lake National Park. And this, for, this has followed um, some other efforts to support um, the management of the park in the protection of species that are important to us as a natural heritage in our country. Next slide. Next slide. So the project's objectives uh, are designed with the three major objectives and to enhance stakeholders' pa participation in the conservation of the species. Um, in this case, to move beyond um, just park management to the support zone communities. Um, secondly, is to de deploy monitoring tools and to build capacity uh, for, um, natural, um, the, for, for the park managers um, to improve um, the protection of the species um, at the end of the project. And then third is to improve um, the livelihoods of 200 tar target participants um, through um, the reduction of unsustainable park resource utilization and the exploitation that leads to the species decline and the degradation of the habitat. Next slide. So um, following uh, the laid um, objectives, um, which is to a, a multifaceted approach to the conservation of the species, um, and we start project implementation, we realize that there are emerging challenges that may be bigger than what we anticipated. And um, a brief background is that in Nigeria, in the north um, eastern part of Nigeria, there's been um, increasing issues of um, insecurity that is forcing a migration to a southward migration um, in the country. And most of the southward migration um, targets um, large uh, area, large unmanaged areas um, for habitation. And this is where the protected areas like the Kanji Lake National Park is facing a lot of pressure. Not just the park, but also the surrounding communities around the park that depend on the park itself are also victims to this increasing insecurity um, that is associated with the movement of different um, elements southwards of the country. And as these migrants move, um, there is an increasing um, attack, there's increasing attack um, to the surrounding communities of the park, as well as within the park itself. 
And this has uh, caused a lot of instability within the park, um, making it difficult to carry out surveys um, of the population of lions and leopards in the park, which is one of the core, um, core objectives of this park. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. So the parts of this park um, where we have the lions and the leopards have um, sometimes been um, taken over by bandits that's moved from place to place around the park. Um, this is now also making it making the existing challenges a little a, more complex um, because those are the challenges we're trying to tackle. And in some cases, the, the outcomes of these challenges have been unfortunately fatal, um, not just to park rangers, but also to the members of the surrounding communities. And this has forced us to make alterations to um, the original um, project implementation plans. Um, but what do we do in the face of these emerging challenges? Um, we've been able to do a, a couple of um, engagements um, with the stakeholders that are targeted through this project. Um, some of, and we've been able to add, uh, we have tried to adopt some of our, for, of our approaches. So for example, we have community-based projects that are supposed to take us to the surrounding communities. But depending on the level, the situation, we've had to centralize certain activities and bring people to central points where we have some level of control over the um, security situation and employing additional um, security to, to um, the plans that we have, we already have on ground. In some cases, we've had to alter the project timelines um, so that we can continue the project. And like um, David said in the introduction, the animals and the work that we're doing cannot, um, the location cannot change because that's the original range of, of these species. And so we've been able to build the capacity of rangers um, in the use of equipment to improve um, species monitoring. Uh, we have built their capacity and, do, and um, been able to support with equipment to make this easy. And we've continued, we've carried out community-based um, sensitization in different communities. Um, that are recipients and receiving of the work that we're doing, especially as they are important in the boundaries of this national park and their activities can be, so if, if the activities around these parks, are, are these areas are sustained, it will reduce the pressure that, um, um, that is faced in the core areas of the park. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the pictures that you can see here are the pictures of the GIS training for the park rangers and the park managers and how they can employ this in um, surveys around the, the park. Um, I mentioned that illegal grazing is one of the major challenges that we are trying to contend um, in the implementation of this project. And one of the ways that we realize that this can be done is to promote cattle ranching as against um, the illegal grazing. And to do this, we have been working with the uh, main cattle uh, livestock farmers association called the Mieti Ala cattle areas that are located in the um, support zone communities around the park. And we've done a lot of uh, multiple sensitizations with them. Um, and they are receptive, they are being receptive of this idea and um, what we intend to do is to make sure we have a working plan to introduce this. However, the situation on ground is making this complex, but we are working with the management of the park to ensure that we can put a practical plan in place for this to, to kickstart. We have trained farmers on uh, managed natural, natural regeneration, especially around the boundaries of the park. And this is because um, during the stakeholders engagement that we carried out, um, the demand for land is for farming is a major um, need for the surrounding communities um, in the park. And this regular practice is to um, is to farm and look for new areas. But uh, we realize that if we train these farmers on the proper management um, of their current farmlands, they're able to um, 
do enrichment planting in these areas and then there will be no need to clear um, um, new areas of the reserve, which uh, opens up the areas for, for more pressure and then contributes to the decline of the prey and the target population. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, we've also engaged women group and um, a major a major stakeholder group. We identified are the hunters um, that depend on the national park for their um, to meet their bush meat demands, and we've been able, we are having um, engage we have continuous engagements with them. Um, for the women, they need. Um, the household need for for energy for household energy needs is met by um, firewood that is sourced from um, the park itself and we're engaging them to see ways that we can provide alternatives that reduce dependency on these resources within the park um, these are some of pictures from some of the meetings that we've had um, and then some pictures from different communities that we um, continue to go to raise awareness and sensitization to these different stakeholders, even at community levels. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the work we're doing, uh, we at some point have done different, um, we deployed camera traps at some of the boundaries of the park to see what the activities around the boundaries are. And um, you can see that this, the, some, some in, the, in, in the picture on the left, um, these are cattle grazing in areas of the park, which is one of the challenges that we're trying to tackle by building the capacity um, of the park managers who have the, um, the, they have the mandate to prosecute such cases. Um, where these are camera traps that we are deploying from areas to areas and from our camera traps and then from the monitoring of the park, um, we've been able to identify footprints of different um, wildlife in this area, um, bush buck, um, helmeted guinea fowl, um, civet cat. Uh, we're also training um, the rangers on the use of drones for um, surveys around the boundaries of the park and also within the park itself. Um, we're also supporting um, the log uh, logistics for movements within the park with uh, motorbikes um, that are shown in the pictures here. Next slide, please. Next slide. And so, um, to, to conclude this talk, um, we realize that the community, the communities are an important part of this project and because it is to meet the, the demands that they, they, they have for their daily subsistence is largely dependent on resources around the park. And so we, we, are, we are very certain that we need to carry on with the objectives and, and the strategic objectives of this project. But to do that, we need to make certain adjustments um, because of the challenges that have emerged with the rising insecurity and that has been exacerbated by um, um, climate change, uh, drier, drier conditions up north. So we maintain a network of stakeholders in the different communities that help us to um, carry, uh, carry out our sensitization programs at the different communities. Uh, we are managing the expectations of these stakeholders because um, our intervention has a limitation. Um, we can't provide the level of security that the people need to thrive. And so we need to work with stakeholders. The management of the National Park is um, working with um, more security outfits and so that um, project goals um, can be achieved alongside the goals of the National Park itself. Um, we maintain openness with the communities as to what we intend to achieve with our project. This is to manage expectations and not cause um, issues that can disrupt, um, further disrupt the, the activities of the project. Um, we'll continue to centralize and cluster our activities 
Um, because in doing that, we're able to uh, manage the security situation by employing additional security measures in these areas. We're also um, trying to be very vigilant so that we don't have um, um, fatal outcomes um, like with a few that have happened um, through the lifespan and outside of the lifespan of the project. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, on the right is a group of um, park rangers that we've worked with um, in deploying and monitoring some of the active, um, um, doing some monitoring in the park and even the community sensitization that we carry out um, around the, the communities. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to dedicate this last slide to some of um, the rangers that are falling um, in the line of their duties to defend um, um, the park. We understand that this is an ultimate sacrifice and um, we hope that their, their souls will continue to rest in, in peace. Next slide. I want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share um, during this project and to also see that the challenges that we have through the lifespan of, of this project is not unique to, to us here in Nigeria alone. And we hope that um, things are better and we can continue to do more to conserve wildlife globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stella. That's another excellent presentation and another set of uh, big challenges. So we're now changing uh, environment from tropical Africa and tropical Southeast Asia to the uh, cold cone of South America. And Christian Saucedo is going to talk about his project in the uh, uh, Cerro Castillo National Park in Patagonia. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I would like to share a little bit about uh, the project that is protecting and reducing the threats for Wemul deer in Cerro Castillo National Park in, in Chile and Patagonia. Uh, next, please. Um, so Wemul or South Andean deer is an endemic deer that lives in the Southern Andes. Uh, it inhabits in, in Chile and Argentina, 70% uh, of the remaining 1,500 individuals lives in, in Chile and 30% of that in Argentina. Um, the species is um, fragmented and isolated. Uh, in this map, uh, you can see the historic part of the historic range and the, the little dots are the current subpopulations that are fragmented al along Patagonia. So it's a medium sized deer of about 70, 80 kilograms of, of, of weight. Uh, it's a stocky build and um, the population today is about 1% of the historic uh, number. So it's really endangered and is one of the 20 large mammals uh, identified as priority mammals in terms to uh, develop restoration activity uh, at large scales, okay? Um, next, please. So the, the species um, inhabits the Patagonian forest, the mountain environment interact with a number of other species like Andean condors, pumas, um, and is a, a browser species that lives um, feeding on, on different species that are available along the year. And Cerro Castillo National Park is one of the last refuges of the species. Uh, it has about 10% of the remaining population of, of this species and make this area of special interest um, from the perspective of, of this species of the Wemul conservation. Uh, in addition, I, I would mention that Wemul uh, with Andean Condor are flagship species. They, they both are present in the coat of arms of Chile, which um, it, it's a, a good um, a good support in terms when we are talking about conservation efforts with the government. Okay, um, next please. Um, as rewilding in Chile, this is, we are in the Southern Cone. Uh, we are specifically in Cerro Castillo National Park. This is a large area of about over 150,000 hectares of land. Um, and the foundation has acquired private land. 
Um, the objective here is to restore and increase the connectivity of that, that the species has lost uh, over time. Um, the, the, uh, so the foundation has promoted the creation of this park and now is adding land that is crucial for the connectivity of the species, okay? So uh, in the map, there is a, a circle that shows um, the, the black areas, sorry, the, the, the darker areas that we have acquired and we have a plan with other partners to acquire and to improve the connectivity of the species, especially in the wintering area, uh, um, the, the, the wintering preferred area by the species. Next. So um, the, the issue that we address here is basically the, the, the threats um, related here is the loss of wintering habitat by the species, especially by historic human occupation, livestock uh, activity, mostly gauchos who are the, the, the local activity are the responsible to uh, cattle grazing, sheep grazing in, in wintering area at valley bottoms. And over time, the species has lost the altitudinal migratory patterns by the presence of this livestock activity and by the fact that this livestock activity is also associated with dogs, with, which are a main threat for the species. Uh, livestock, by other hand, in addition to displacement of Wemul, uh, is a source of disease. And recently, a number of different disease, bacterial, viral, viral sorry, uh, disease have been detected on Wemul. And specifically, uh, Cassius lymphadenitis, a bacterial disease, has been identified as of large concern for this specific subpopulation in Cerro Castillo, which become uh, a big crisis from the livestock perspective, from the health uh, perspective for national authorities and local authorities. Next, please. So what we have been uh, doing uh, along the, the project, we have, first of all, we have uh, established formal agreements with the Chilean government at national and regional level. Uh, the perspective or, or the objective here is to promote uh, a collaborative work uh, as the species uh, require a, a multidisciplinary approach and a collaborative approach from the state, from the academic, from the NGOs, and from the community. In addition to that, we have um, uh, increased and complement what the Chilean Park Service is doing in terms of uh, park wardens patrolling, monitoring through camera trappings to understand uh, the the issues and the interaction between Wemul, livestock, and dogs in the area. Uh, we have also tested the use of uh, mineral and salt blocks uh, as su supplementation for Wemul, as they are not acquiring minerals and vitamins uh, from the lowland. We are providing them in, in areas that just Wemul is using. And to control the, the issue about livestock, we have um, built some fences that control and put the livestock out of the park boundaries, but we also identify areas where we mule are crossing and we implement in the fences what we call a, a we mule friendly uh, fence that is um, basically is some spaces that allow the deer to move in between the lines of the fences, which has been very effective and in this way we are not we are controlling the the movement of cows but we are allowing the the movement of wemul through private land or private land to uh, the national park next slide please so um what we have accomplished we the area is also the the gate uh, of important trekking circuits so we have through the project, we have increased uh, the possibility to establish uh, signs and information for public visitors. We have increased the public awareness in the in the in the road that crossed the national park. Here are some pictures that show 
uh, visitors and, and tourists that stop and have for, for first time the possibility to interact with these species. So we are developing a sense of responsibility and connection. And in parallel with that, uh, we have um, uh, the, the relationship with the Chilean government, with park wardens, with technical staff of the Chilean Park Service, the Chilean Wildlife Service, and the Livestock Service had increased because we are we are all uh, sharing the main objective that is how to deal the health and conservation issues in this area that is uh, one part of the park is, is accessible by, by a road, which create this opportunity to talk about the issues that the species face, but also is an opportunity to show um, and to implement uh, multi-sectorial, multi-organization activities in the area. Uh, so we work dealing with the issues with dogs, with livestock, the fencing, the fact that we need in, in the Chilean legislation, uh, livestock is not allowed to be inside national parks. Okay, uh, next please. Um, something that was unexpected over the development of the project was the issue of wild boar as a threat for, for the species. Uh, it, this is an exotic here in Patagonia. It's a species that, that had increased uh, its distribution and represent a threat for Wemul. Um, so, uh, there is no much experience from the wildlife service and by fortune uh, during this project we also uh, we were able to deal with this issue to advance to develop some workshops some technical workshops and install for first time some uh, traps that were specific specifically designed to trap uh, wild water in this area this is very important uh, we know that is impossible to uh, eliminate or to eradicate the, the wild boar, but basically what we are doing, we are concentrating our work, especially in those areas that are critical for Wemul. Um, in Las Orquetas, this property that was acquired by the foundation that, that we will add to the national park is a critical area because it's a corridor for the species and um, Wemul, uh, we have about 40 individuals that occupy that area in winter. So uh, if we develop actions to reduce the density and the presence of wild water in this area is something that is, is really well accepted. And uh, by fortune, the park service is also advancing in this in partnership with the livestock service and monitoring the health issues related with wild water. Next, please. So uh, the most, uh, I would say, the, it, from a, a large perspective, uh, one very important thing uh, that has been pivotal in the case of this project is that Cerro Castillo area has become uh, uh, an icon uh, to develop actions for this, for this species, especially because we develop a formal agreement with the agriculture ministry at very high level uh, um, making a strong commitment from the government point of view and involving different service, the wildlife, the livestock, and the health uh, service to be involved in the in the crucial areas where Wemul uh, distribution or, or where these subpopulations of Wemul are in Patagonia. So we are now concentrated. We start in Cerro Castillo National Park, but we, we are now developing other actions in Patagonia National Park, in Tutaleufu National Reserve, uh, and in Pumalín Douglas Tompkins National Park. So over time, our dream, our commitment with the, with the government, with the Chilean government, is to expand the control of threats, the monitoring of Wemul, the inclusion and the, the improvement of um, wintering habitat for the species which are critical uh, for the, the recovery of the species and the gene flow amongst these uh, subpopulations. Uh, next, please. I, I think that this is the last one. So it has been a pleasure to share a little bit of what we have been doing in, in Chile and Patagonia, and specifically on Wemul as a flagship species, as an umbrella of, of conservation and rewilding in Patagonia. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much indeed. That's another uh, very different uh, set of circumstances there. Um, we're now going to move on to the uh, to a discussion and the questions and answers. So the questions so far have been a, a mix of general questions and um, specific points to individual speakers. So I think I'll start with one question which um, brings out a bit of a contrast between the two, between some of the talks there. And the question is, do we see that con community based conservation pushes governments to take authority? And should we should we put more of our efforts or all of our efforts into the uh, community conservation and just uh, forget other other uh, other um, other approaches? That's to say, favour the con the community approaches above all the others. Um, Stella, would you like to just um, say what you what you think there, please, about the uh, co contrast between working with the government and working with the communities? Yeah, so it's 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 a tricky question uh, because it looks like you when you're relating with communities, um, you can make progress. But the trick is when it comes to the enforcement of laws, you need the government. And when you work, um, especially if taking taking an example from what we do, we work with the government, and then we realize that there is limited resources even for government. Um, so supporting both would be the best approach but finding a balance that works um so that while you support the livelihoods of communities that are supposed to disturb these protected areas um the government can also do its enforcement in ensuring that um um the laws are not broken uh we I, so i think finding a balance would would be the ideal thing because as conservation organizations, there's a limitation to what we can do when it comes to enforcement. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Neywin, you had no government uh, support in your uh, field area. So what, what would you say to this question about uh, concentrating on con concentrating conservation efforts on communities uh, versus other approaches? So with the with the current situation here, yeah, we have no government authority controlling. So we are expecting, you know, community has a uh, uh, ability, you know, and capacity to uh, control this, I mean, to protect this area and also with the, the species live in there. Yeah, uh, that is our aim for the, the current situation. But we are expecting in the same day, uh, you know, when the, our political situation is uh, stable again, and you know, there's a government body, that, and then at the time, uh, our expression will be a kind of like a top, uh, you know, bottom up approach to the, you know, the government uh, community can be, uh, be, we also have a law, you know, the, for the community priority area. I mean, yeah, the, the, the one type of the priority area is the community priority area. So community can be, you know, make a bottleneck approach to government uh, to protect this area uh, officially. But again, for the uh, enforcement for that, with the current situation, to be honest, we cannot make any enforcement. We don't want to make uh, make any kind of conflict with the, you know, the, the employees or, you know, other people, I mean, by the community. So there's no enforcement. But uh, one day, you know, when they have, uh, what I call the, you know, the, uh, the right to protect the, you know, uh, this area as a community protected area, they can also have a right to be enforced and, and then with the support of the government. Uh, that is the, you know, our 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 expectation in the future. Okay, thanks, Nirin. Uh, Christian, you said that you worked closely with the government. So clearly your, your situation is a, a little bit different to Nawin and, and Stella's. So do, do you do, do you have big involvement with local communities in the Huemol project? Yeah, um, that, that is a, a key component, but it's, it, it takes time. It's, um, it it requires commitment, it requires confidence to build confidence with the neighbors of the park in, in the buffer area. And it's something that over time have been developed by the park wardens and, and the team. So uh, for sure, uh, that is a, a key component because uh, decision makers and, and local leaders and politicians, they 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 are sensitive to what the, the local communities, the, the neighbors, um, 
uh, feelings about the, the the implementation of of conservation strategies. So in our case, we we are uh, making a transition from a typical um, livestock subsistence economy to a tourism economy based on conservation. Okay, thanks. So, and does this li um, alternative livelihood produce benefits, Christian, for the people, for the local people, or will it? In it, does the plan in involve uh, any kind of financial or material benefits to the local communities? Yeah, well, um, in initially, the the first step is to improve improve the the health status of the livestock, the to improve the the good practice of of livestock, and for sure to develop a, a proper plan to reduce the interaction between livestock and, and wildlife, in this case, the deer. Um, but over time, we have already people who are developing touristic uh, operations associated in the buffer area of the park and uh, adding value by the fact that they have Wemulo on their properties. OK, thanks. Um, Stella, could you just say a little bit more about the alternative livelihoods in KNG Lake, particularly how you how you engage the women and what livelihood alternatives or options you're providing for them? OK, so um, we know that um, women majorly are primarily um, homemakers and during the stakeholders engagement, was um, the need for energy uh, alternatives because they depend on um, the, the park uh, for fuel wood. And um, so the provision of all um, efficient stores is one option, um, but the implementation of that, um, how we would normally go about it is to ensure that the production of the fuel wood is done within the community. And so this provides another level of um, um, livelihood for different stakeholders um, that will be doing the production and then providing that need so they have um, less demand for fuel wood um, to, to utilize um, at home. But we also found out that there are women that are farmers and so there is the need for a balance. So another approach is to promote the managed natural regeneration where we are promoting enrichment farming in farmlands and these trees, when they grow, can be pruned to provide um, well, um, fell wood as well to um, to household needs. So these are the approaches, um, the approach that we're using for for the women um, alongside the sensitization for them to understand why we are um, doing what we do within within the national park and the boundaries. Okay, thanks. And Stella, just again, you said you had 50, engaged fifty hunters in focal group discussions. So yes. Did, have they responded well to to this? I mean, are they happy to take part in conservation and um, abandon hunting? Yes, they're excited, um, but we also have to manage their expectation because um, a lot of them want to work and so they want to transition um, to become park rangers. Um, but it's not within our power to do this, but we also are trying to find a balance to set them up as um, community based organization and that over time we can engage to also carry out the monitoring um, around their own um, monitoring within their own capacity and as support to the, the efforts of the national park. And so we are looking for a strategy that would make this, looking at the strategy to, to make this work. Um, but we need to manage their expectations. They are very happy to, to cross to the other side, but we also have to ensure that we are not just um, it's not a carrot stick approach, but something that that, that can be sustained um, over a long period of time. Okay, thanks. And uh, Nguyen, what about you in in uh, southern Myanmar? I mean, you said also that bushmeat hunting was very important, and that included hunting of tigers in the past. And clearly, there's a big difference between somebody who hunts, um, say, a small rodent for meat, and somebody hunting a tiger for sale for a much higher value. Uh, product. So, have you had um, any? Uh, have you have you got any insights to share on the alternative livelihoods, particularly in relation to um, persuading people to switch from hunting bushmeat and poaching tigers? Yeah, we were. Yeah, with the current situation, we are focusing uh, with the community to be a kind of you know, to reduce the 
uh, the handing of the, the Tiger Prey. So that is like that's why we focus the uh, community, you know, providing the kind of you know animal animal raising activity is like the pig or chicken or goat, and so that will be a kind of replacement of the uh what I call the meat, you know, uh consumption in the in the in their village and in their region. So currently, and um, also again for the kind of we also provide the the cash crop for the short term cash projects, you know, doing in their uh, compound or in nearby the villages because it is not too safe to travel far away from their their, their villages. Um, but this can be reduced to the you know the poaching of the uh, tiger prey like for the you know somebody else or bacteria or something like this. But uh, to reduce the to stop totally stop the tiger handy. To be honest, that is the really difficult what to call it you know what to call it difficult to stop the, the hunter but uh, currently uh, what we can do is the the community team is just making their uh, regular patrol in the key habitat area and also they also do the awareness and, and then this can be a kind of you know uh, preventing uh, to the hunter uh, specific you know the tiger hunter can we do the forest for tiger hunting or maybe if they're doing setting up the snare you know to preventing of the setting up the snare targeting the tiger and this kind of thing um the within last two three year uh we did not uh, have uh, any record or you know not any here of the the tiger hunting in this area Okay, good. Thank you. Well, that's quite interesting. I mean, Stella mentioned, uh, you know, very rightly at the end of her presentation, um, she showed the slide opt dedicated to the rangers who had uh, died during the course of their work. So is it not dangerous for your community rangers to be working in an area where there are tiger poachers? That is really, really dangerous, you know, activity thing. Uh, that's why uh, we... I mean, we have a discussion with the community and community also agreed not to be directly deal with the, the, the uh, tiger hunter in the forest. Particularly, I mean, what they can do is they, they can remove and they can destroy the, uh, the snare targeting for the, for the tigers or you know, any other species in the forest. But uh, they were not, we are not encouraging, you know, to deal with the, any person, you know, may hunter, uh, meeting in the forest, just is like you know, if even though they made it, they never say you know you are not, you should not do the handy, but they just make very friendly, you know, uh, saying that okay, we are doing conservation and maybe that is a kind of you know very what you call careful approach, you know, to deal with this this person. So because of you know the hunter normally has a gun if they are doing tiger handy, you know our team has no gun and you know they have to be very careful about you know what you call engage with the, the, this kind of people. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that this, this, this is your question, yeah? Yeah, yes, thank you very much, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, on a separate, on a new topic, we've had a lot of questions about the use of technology to reduce the issues with working in um, challenging environments. So Christian, have you used any, any, any particular technologies that have been useful to you in Patagonia? such as remote sensing or uh, satellite uh, technology like this? Uh, right now is something that we we are incorporating into the projects that we are running uh, along what we call the, the route of parks. That is a, a large and, and remote area of over 17 national parks. Uh, but it's something that to date we, we have not working in depth. Um, so it's something that soon we we hope to to advance over. Um, with drones, we had some uh, pilot studies with the with the with the wildlife service and some census, and but no specifically on, on remote sensing. And of course, the basic technology that we use for for wildlife monitoring and 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 threats on 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 parks is camera trapping and recently some of these camera trappings are now in, in in areas where connectivity is available that are not so many but we and, and face in important issues we these cameras are allowing us to monitor in real time 
and with the help of artificial intelligence, uh, threats like the, the issue that I mentioned about dogs, uh, about livestock in, in Wemula Vita. Okay, thanks. Stella, you mentioned that, that you'd been training the rangers to use drones, and obviously motorcycles is not new technology, but we've mm. had a couple of questions about the use of either more efficient or solar stoves to reduce the impact on the environment and make life easier for the for the families. Have you had any experience of that? Um, not solar stoves particularly, but um, fuel efficient stoves. Uh, we've had experience with that in other areas and it has worked and it is part of what we plan to use here. Um, but we would also take a look at the solar stoves because um, the less um, demands we have for these natural resources, the better for us. So we'll see what works and um, um, how we can incorporate it into the rest of what we're doing in, in Nigeria. Okay, thanks. Uh, Naywen, have you any, um, do you have any experience of using remote sensing in, in Myanmar, in your study site, or any other technology which has helped you to um, implement the project objectives? Uh, yeah, we, we, use the, we, we use the remote sensing uh, to monitor the, I mean, to, to see the changes of the forest landscape. Uh, particularly now, we are using that to check in the remote sensing, you know, compared with the before the military coup uh, and also the, during the, you know, the military coup. So we can understand, you know, what is the, you know, land cover changes or maybe some areas uh, increase the engagement or something like this. Yeah, before the military coup, we also use a kind of the, the drone. So just flying you the drone and, you know, the record the, uh, I mean, the, with the drone, you know, we can make it the more, what you call uh, high resolution photo, then, and then we can also make a more, you know, calculation, the uh, accuracy of the calculation thing. Okay, thank you. We've also had some very, some more specific questions. So there's one here for Christian, um, whether you could uh, develop the Huemul as a flagship for um, conservation in, in, in your area? Does it have the potential to be a flagship for locally based conservation? Yeah, more than, than a potential is a flagship for sure. And, and we employ in that way uh, for conservation purpose. And, um, but it, it's a quite of, uh, it's, it's tricky because sometimes it's a flagship that, for instance, many Chileans never had a chance to, to meet, to, to see. So it's a kind of a ghost. So this is why Cerro Castillo National Park and the Root of Parks is very important because it allows the, the identity, the possibility that people connect with the species. And, and for sure, uh, Wemul is a perfect case because it's an endangered species, it's in the coat of arms of Chile. And so all this collaborative approach through the, what we call the National Corridor uh, Wemul, uh, the Wemul National Corridor is to improve the connectivity of the species, to improve the conditions of these subpopulations that are fragmented, and to reduce threats, because this is what the species is facing along its distribution. The only way that it recovers is if we address the issues with cows, with livestock, with disease, and uh, with dogs. So, yeah, for sure, we, we are taking advantage of the fact that Wemul is in this position in terms of a flagship. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Nguyen, we had a question from a UK-based charity um, who's asking, what are the impacts of the conflict on the rivers and uh, fish species in Myanmar? Do you yeah. have any information on that, in, uh, particularly in, this, in the south where you are working on your project? Yeah, in the in the south and also in the farther north, in the particularly in the northern Myanmar, uh, one of the our main river, Iyawi River, and its territory has a really you know seriously you know issue with the you know the coal mining in the river. So you know, and also like the you know kind of you know the coal mining technique in the middle of the river using the raft and you know collecting the you know, the swine from the bottom of the river and then, you know collecting the coal and also at the same time some part of the river they also 
you know, remove the, the river bend or the, you know, sand from the river bend and, you know, quality the, uh, quality the coal from the sand. So, the, particularly in the Ayawri River and also the north of the Chenu River has a seriously issue with the, you know, this coal mining, uh, what do you call it? the coal mining the after the, after the, you know, this quality crisis. And the also in the Tenedori region, but not in our project site, but in the northern part of the uh, river, Tenedori River also have uh, this kind of uh, same issue with the you know the coal mining quality there. And you know again you know consequently the the the, the, the fish you know and the aquatic animal living in this part of area is uh, really fading, and particularly you know the the, the sedimentation in the river and also like. What about the other, you know, consequence of the geological things happening? Yes. Okay, thanks. And there was a specific question for Stella too. I mean, you mentioned in your presentation that the uh, that the climate change was forcing people farther south. Um, is the government? How, does the government, or in general? Uh, or the re regional government or national government have any strategies for mitigation of this? Are there any predictions as to how severe this problem is going to be, or how far south the the movement might occur? And you know, do you do you know yourself what the impacts might be on on your key species in the in the next 10, 20 years? Um, so we are making um, these predictions and. Uh... Uh, unfortunately, it looks like the impacts are faster than we are even predicting um, because it is not just climate change now acting on its own, but um, the anthropogenic element that is um, now um, impacting that, that, that climate, climate um, uh, issue. Um, so the government has recently, the new government in Nigeria has launched a blue economy and it's doing a lot of work to to mainstream the issues of climate change. And um, fortunately, the organization, um, Nigerian Conservation Foundation, um, is strategic in, in some of these issues. So we are trying to mainstream this conversation and so that it goes beyond the conversation, but to actual actions that will mitigate the impacts um, of, of, clim of climate change. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Stella. Right, just to give you you three a, a, a short rest, there's one question which really is for the IUCN SOS team, and I hope Anna can answer this. And the question is, there are many researchers who are funded by IUCN, including through the SOS project. Many of them are young and emerging scientists. Are there any formal programs to connect them with IUCN specialists when they come across a research uh, problem? Thank you, David, and thank you for that question. Um, I think it's a really great one. We indeed have um, a current uh, program under the Fundación Segre Conservation Fund, where we are funding um, scientists, uh, young scientists uh, on conservation action on different topics. So, um, I mean, I think that through the work of this program, the, the scientists can can be in touch with, with our staff in the Save Our Species uh, uh, Secretariat, and then we can be, be the ones connecting them with, uh, with those uh, other scientists and, and experts from the Species Survival Commission, but beyond that as well, from the other commissions that IUCN has. So I would just strongly encourage uh, the, the scientists benefiting from the grants to, to let us know that they are interested in exchanging, sharing their knowledge and experiences through that. Uh, um, but also, we will also actively uh, offer this opportunity to our to our grantees. And one of the one of the um, the opportunities as well is through this type of webinars that we are already organizing. Uh, thank you, David. No, thank you. And there's a, a final question is linked to that. I think it's going to be a bit difficult to answer it today, but it's how can scientists from more open or developed countries support local scientists who are working in difficult political or regulatory situations? So I think that question really addresses many of the topics that we've covered today. And it's there's no time left to really answer it. But I think that I, ho I hope that something can be uh, established and this webinar will be the first of several, I think, opening a dialogue about
conservation work in challenging environments. Is that reasonable, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. I I I totally think that this is something that our um yeah our scientists can certainly support the the uh, yeah the 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 people that are in these situations and I think that the knowledge sharing uh, is 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 critical. But I would be interested in hearing what the other uh, panelists also can can contribute to that. Okay, just very quickly then, you three, have you got anything to say on that? How can how can scientists uh, basically support people working in challenging environments? And that's within IUCN and outside IUCN. Um, Christian, do you want to go first? Okay, well, uh, I think that uh, very important is the establishment of, of networks. Uh, I, I believe in the fact that exist especially groups and Today is much more easy to be connected with experts in, of uh, places that are far away and, and exchange mistakes, learnings, and, and part of this webinar and, and other instances is exactly that. So um, I strongly believe in, in the power of the exchange of experience uh, that uh, it, it represents an, an opportunity that new uh, scientists support uh, activities that are uh, developing in the different uh, parts of, of the world. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ney Nelwin, you have any anything to add to that, please? Uh, yes, a very similar idea with uh, Christian. But in addition to that, maybe I think, you know, if something like about, uh, I mean, the person who needs a something like specific, you know, issue or facing issue or, you know, specific, I mean, support maybe just email to be some of the, you know, the experts in the IUCN or maybe maybe other, you know, organization directly. And I think nowadays, you know, everybody are, you know, the willing to, what to call that, you know, share their experience. And also the good thing is the, like, you know, the, after the COVID, you know, it kind of, you know, the Zoom and this kind of thing is already available. Some people can just arrange some meeting and, you know, sharing that, that thing. That is also the another possible way. Okay, thanks. And Stella, quickly, do you have any more to add? Yeah, just a little to add. More more programs like this where there is knowledge sharing and knowledge exchange. And of course, the most the most experienced of people would also be looking at new challenges. So it's always going to be a way to exchange. I mean, if you were working on lions in Africa 20 years ago, your sets of problems would be different from what we have on ground. So forums like this would you should happen more, and so that we can exchange and um, look for new ways to to combat the challenges of conservation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of the time for questions and the discussion. Thanks again to all our three speakers for their wonderful presentations and all their insights on their three very different and challenging field sites. Thanks for all the questions and thanks for your attention. I'm going to hand back to Ana Nieto. Thank you. Thank you, David. I mean, not not much more to say from my side. I just want to thank you, David, for for facilitating this uh, this fight, fascinating discussion, uh, to our speakers who are the real heroes. I agree with you, Stella. Uh, it's amazing the drive, the motivation, and the commitment that that you and your teams have in preserving our wildlife. So yeah, a big thank you to all of you, to everybody that has uh, joined us today and has contributed so lively to the discussion, and to the IUCN team behind the scenes that are helping making this uh, happen. And thank you again, everybody, and I hope to see you all again at our next webinar.